Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, by the way. Okay, I'll just test the clicker because I have luck. Okay, I have luck today, I hope. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Noi, and I'm super excited to be right here. First of all, I want to thank everyone who actually stayed up until now. I really appreciate it. I know that's like a difficult challenge. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Cypher injection. So, my name is Noi, and basically, I started this research like one year ago. And I just Googled for Cypher injections, and I find, found like one and a half articles about it. And I was like, what? But we can have an injection. So my whole goal today is that like half a year from now, everyone in this audience will be able to just publish a write-up of bug bounty of Cypher injection. That's it. So basically, we're going to talk about what it is exactly. Uh, you don't really have to know what SQL injection is, but just to make sure, this is not about SQL injection. There is one slide about it. This is about Cypher injection. So let's start. So I'm working as a security researcher. I was one of the members in the group of Tom Rezaid, who created Capture the Flag Challenges. And I really like to research stuff and to learn about new stuff. And I also really like to dance especially after I find the vulnerability. And I have like the best dog ever, in my opinion. But it's more accurate to say that he actually owns me. OK, so I want you to actually have five takeaways out of this talk today. I really want each one of, one of you to know what is Cypher and what are graph databases. I want you to actually be able to inject into those graph databases and to be able to escalate your attack even further than that, to cause as many damage as you can or as many damage as I possibly could during my research. I really want you to understand how to protect from these kind of injections and also how to minimize the attack surface in case you have an injection like that. And eventually, not only the talk, I also want to give you some tools to understand what you do right now. I wrote some cool playground, um, which I really want you to use it, but we have a lot to talk about, so let's start. Cypher. So forget for 40 minutes about everything you know about the word Cypher. We're not talking about Caesar Cypher or any Cypher of crypto. We're talking about something different. We're talking about Open Cypher. Now, this is just a query language that you use, so you write queries in Cypher language, and those queries are written to graph databases. So they perform some actions on graph databases. Um, and this is basically how you use it. So no SQL, again, only Cypher right here. And whenever I say Cypher query injection, I'm sorry, whenever I say Cypher, I actually mean Ceph open Cypher. Um, so let's proceed. I really want you to understand what is graph database, uh, because I said these uh, two words too many times up until now. So let's take, for example, relational database. We have those tables and rows and columns that you're already familiar with. And we have graph database. Now, there is a circle. You can call it a node. And there is an arrow between two nodes. You can call it a relationship. So there is actually, you can read this at SpongeBob lives at Pineapple House. Um, and this is just how the database looks like. No rows, no tables. And if you look at the bottom right, you can see that there is Neo4j. This is one of the biggest companies that use graph database nowadays. There is um, Redis Graph, which is just an extension of Cypher. You can actually write Cypher queries that perform actions on Redis database. And there is also Amazon Epton, which also supports Cypher query. So it's pretty cool. And there are much more databases that nowadays are starting to support Cypher. And Neo4j actually open source Cypher. And they actually made this open cipher. So whenever I say open cipher, I actually mean cipher query. OK, so we talked about graph databases and basically what is cipher. But we want to know much more about cipher. And again, this is not SQL. This is cipher. This is something that is pretty new to most of us. So in order to um, do this, I just created the world of SpongeBob in a database. 
And you can see right here that there are nodes of characters, such as Mr. Crab and SpongeBob. And there are nodes of places, such as Krusty Crab, Sandy Streetum, Chum Bucket. And this is how a graph database actually looks like. So you can see that, for example, if we take SpongeBob, who is a friend of Sandy, who lives at Sandy Streetum, this is just a relationship between those nodes. And basically, this is how we actually see those graph databases. So we talked about how it looks like, about that it's not like a table. But let's understand and dig into the actual interesting terms of Cypher or even of graph databases. So we talked about nodes and relationship already. We can have an arrow between two nodes. And the direction doesn't really matter in our case and all of this talk. And at the bottom, you can see uh, some query. Dismiss match and return for a second. And there is a variable that you can actually define in your Cypher query. You can call it C right here. There are labels that you can use. So there is character label, some like a type of a node. And there are properties you can actually assign to nodes. So you can assign name and age and birth date to SpongeBob's node. Um, and basically, that's it. Those are the basic terms of Cypher. Now, if we look at a query example of Cypher, then instead of the select from, we have match and return. So for example, if you want in Cypher query to get all the characters, then we will write a query to match C variable that will bring back all the nodes with the type character and return C. We have to use return after match so that Cypher will know what we want to get back from the result of the query. And if you want, for example, to get a character by a specific name, we use the same match and then a where clause. So for example, where C that name equals to SpongeBob return C. So this is like the basic example of how you use Cypher. OK, so we talked pretty too much about Cypher. We just want to dig into the actually interesting stuff that most of us came here for, the actual attack, the actual exploitation, um, and the leverage on the functionalities. Let's just start with SQL. I promise this will be the only slide about SQL. This is not a SQL um, talk. But let's just do a very quick brief about what is SQL injection. We have an example right here of a query in SQL where we just get all the characters from a database where the name equals to some value. Imagine that the SpongeBob value actually comes from the user, so that's the user input. In this case, we'll bring back to the user only the data of SpongeBob. But in a case that the user is actually an attacker, instead of SpongeBob, they will insert something like SpongeBob and double quotes, and then we'll insert a term that will return true always, and two dashes to comment out the rest of the query. So what will actually happen right here is that for each one of the rows in the table, it will be checked whether the name is SpongeBob or whether one equals one. And since one equals one will return true regardless of the name, we will have this injection, we will have this exploit, and we'll be able to get other information we shouldn't have gotten. So basically, this is um, just SQL injection in nutshell. And we're going to use this knowledge from this slide to actually inject into Cypher. OK, so let's get back into Cypher injection. We have pretty much similar query, but in Cypher. So we want to get all the characters that have some specific name that we get from the user. So the name equals to some user input. And in this case, there is legitimate user just inputs the SpongeBob value. So we bring back the node that has the name SpongeBob. Pretty much boring. Let's go into the real interesting part. Now, in Cypher, instead of SpongeBob, the attacker will insert something like SpongeBob with single quote. And then again, we'll insert a term that will return true always and return C with two slashes to comment out the rest of the query. So what will happen right here is that we will get not only SpongeBob node, but other nodes as well. And we just inserted the injection. So notice that all the red background text will be actually the injection. And this is what an attacker should probably insert. But you can just stop me right now and say, OK, we have to know to inject return C. We're an attacker from outside. We have no idea that there is a variable defined that's called C. So how would we know to insert return C as the injection? And I will tell you that you're totally right. This is an issue that we are going to overcome in a few slides. 
So keep that in mind, and let's keep with the injections for now. But we're going to solve this issue. OK, and the next thing that an attacker can actually do is to use this injection not only to get other data, but to actually be able to tamper with our other data. So he or she will insert delete C. And then what will happen is that the actual node will be deleted. And this is like pretty similar injection. But we don't want to, move, to do more damage through all this stuff. So let's see how we can just delete everything, and not only our own poor node. What we will insert this is the same example uh, as before. But this time, we will insert something like this. Now, all of this red background text will be the actual injection. We will insert, again, SpongeBob with single quotes to end the string. And then we'll insert two clauses. The first one will be match with all character. So we will create a variable called all to get all the labels that has the character. And then we'll insert delete all. So we will be able to delete all the characters. So again, we'll do two actions right here. First of all, we will get all the characters. And then we will delete all the characters. And this will be our injection. But we don't see the query. I mean, I am returning to the previous question that I avoided. We don't actually know that there is a return C. I mean, we don't know to inject return C. We don't know that there is a label called character in the database because we are an attacker from outside. We have no idea how the database actually looks like. So how can we still be able to inject something? Because obviously, we have to use this return, um, but still not break the query. Let's see how we're going to do it. We're going to exfiltrate data eventually. We're going to just leak data to outside. And we're going to do this by leveraging a very legitimate functionality in Neo4j called load CSV. Now, again, Neo4j is just one of the biggest database, like graph databases today. Um, and if you search for graph databases, most chances that we come up like top three or top one. So we're going to use load CSV functionality in Neo4j in order to deal with the issue that we had previously, that we're not able to see the query. We're going to use this. So let's see how we're going to use it. We have this functionality, and all it does is just importing data from other external CSV file. So you just want to, for example, to insert data of 20,000 um, records. You don't type it manually. You just use load CSV, so you will load from this CSV manually. Um, and th by that, you'll be able to use the data. Like This is very legitimate. But what it does is that it enables you to use in the query um, a, a method that enables us to actually send a GET request to external service. And that is huge. It means that we can define any service we want, and a GET request will be sent using our injection. Now, let's see actually how we can use it. But basically, we have a case of blind injection right here, where we actually able to inject into a query, but we are not able to see the actual response that is returned. So for that, we get help from low CSV. So we, we use it as a kind of a pipe between the actual database and be between our own controlled server. So we'll be able to leak data from the injection to outside to us. But let's see how we can actually do it. So I know this is a lot of text, but we actually insert those four lines as the injection. Dismiss the last line. What we actually do here will be to run procedure called db.labels. It actually returns back all the labels in a database to us. Then we use load CSV from, and we put our own URL to our own server, and we'll append the label at the end of the URL. So what will actually be is there will be a GET request to our own server with the leaked labels. Um, and the two slashes, of course, at the end of the injection to comment out the rest of the query. But this will, what we will see if we just use, for example, Burpsuit Collaborator to see uh, the, the request, we will get a request to our own server with the leaked label from the injection from the database. And as you can see in the second line, the user agent is actually in Neo Load CSV Java, which means that the GET request was sent directly from the injection that we made with the help of the nice Load CSV in Neo4j. So using this technique, we can just leak more and more parts of the database. Now we know that there is a label called character. 
we insert match C character, and again, all of this will be in the injection, and then we'll use load CSV from with the URL to our own server. Epoch tech join, so dismiss this for a second, but keys will see. So keys um, will actually return all the properties of the character. And epoch text join is just to turn for, transform the list um, to a string, so we can append it at the end of the URL. And this is basically what we will return to get back all the properties. So we will be able to leak also the name properties outside. And for each one of the properties in the database, we will get another get request. And again, it was from load CSV in Neo4j. So pretty cool. The last thing that we want to leak will be actually the values, the fun values of SpongeBob and Patrick. So we know that there is a label called character. We know that there is a property called name. We want to leak right now c.name that you see at the end of the second line. We will leak Patrick and Mr. Crab with a simple typo I made. But basically, we will be able to leak the values of the actual names, and by that, even delete what we want. Because right now, we leaked anything we wanted from the database, and we'll be able to tamper and just exfiltrate data as we wish. So we were able to bypass this issue of not being able to see um, what we inject. But as I said in the beginning, we want to cause as many damage as we can during all this talk. And it's not enough for us to just destroy the database, to delete data. We want to do much more. So let's see what else we can do. We're going to escalate our attack and cause denial of service. We're going to prevent access to the database. We're going to perform SSRF and RFI. And I'm going to explain why it is uh, when we reach to those sites. But basically, we're going to access sensitive information, files, and leak data outside and even access hidden endpoints. We're going to eventually cause lateral movement in such a way that we'll be able to leak other data from other services, not only the service that is vulnerable to the injection itself. And we're going to also talk about AWS, DCP, and what else we can leak when we have access to a machine in the cloud itself. So we're going to show how we can do all those things. And eventually, we're going to talk about alternatives to load CSV and what we can do in other databases as well, and not only in load CSV, even Neo4j. OK, so the first thing that we can actually do in the injection itself, we can call dbms.list connections, which will actually return back all the connection IDs to us. We will put this in the injection itself, and we will use load CSV to leak all the connection IDs to us. And the next thing will be to either kill a connection or kill a list of connections. Now, the connections are not the simple connections between the user and the applications. Those are actually the powerful connections between the server and the database itself. And if we do so in an automated script, imagine that it can just cause enough service on the database and prevent from a lot of queries of legitimate users to be executed. Now, I will say that it really depends on the roles and permissions that you actually have. If you have the default role of admin, you will be able to do so with a simple injection with load CSV. But we're going to talk much more about the roles and permissions. Basically, we can just drop databases. So we can leak the names of the databases with the load CSV trick. And then we can just drop a database. So we were able to cause enough service on the database. We were able to delete data and change data and maybe annoy some users. But still, it's not enough for us. So let's see what else we can do. We're going to perform SSRF right now. Now, SSRF is a web-based vulnerability where an attacker actually creates an HTTP request in such a way that is malicious. It reaches to, through the firewall to the server itself. And because of how the request is constructed, then Either the server sends a request to himself or to another internal server, gets the response from it, and then returns the response to the attacker. So it looks just as if the attacker is actually sitting after the firewall and not behind it, and is able to just manipulate the server into sending a lot of internal requests and access a lot of sensitive files, keys, and endpoints. And we're going to see how we're going to do this with load CSV. This is Pretty simple trick, but you can achieve a lot with it. So we can actually cause SSRF with load CSV. And this is an example. So what we will we'll actually do, we have this 
same case that we talked about, when we actually have an injection in a vulnerable server in Neo4j, we can just use those CSV from, but this time we won't use our own server. We use the URL of another internal server. And what will actually happen right here is that the vulnerable server will send a GET request to one of the internal servers that we will define from the load CSV from. And it's pretty powerful. We can access hidden endpoints. We can enumerate directories. We can use command uh, and brute force directories and files that we usually use in bug, bug bounty. Um, and basically, if we want to do something more focused, whether we talk about cloud environments or GCP or AWS, for example, in AWS, there is a service called metadata service, which is a service that sits in a static IP. And it holds a lot of metadata information about your roles and permissions and with which other machines you can actually communicate with. So what you can actually do here is you can use low CSV from to query the metadata service to get a response back and to be able to know to which other machines you can escalate your attack. So it's pretty much a lot. For example, if you see that you have access to query the secret manager of AWS, then you're able to get a lot of sensitive files and passwords from there. And also, you can just escalate to, through one machine and not another if you just know that you can communicate with this other machine in the cloud. So it's pretty much a lot. One fine point to know that in V1, you can do this, but in V2, you cannot, because in V2, there is a session that you have to establish between the user that wants to, the permission and between the metadata service. So you actually have to attach your own token in the header of the request. And since we use load CSV from right here, and we cause a GET request, we need to actually find a way to attach this token in the header when we send this request to the media service. And it's like funny to think you will have a potentially ability to decide on the header that will be sent in the request uh, using load CSV. So I didn't find a way to do so. And it's a nice thing to know why else you should upgrade to um, media service version 2. So we saw basically the concept, but let's talk about actually ciphertext. What we can do right here is I have a very cringy version of server that holds in some endpoint you should never be able to access externally and holds some very secret. Um, and in this point, I'm, I'm going to say that this, imagine this endpoint actually sits in another server, not in the server that actually runs new 4J in the database. What we do right here will be, all this will be the injection itself. Again, this missed the last line. Um, but we will use two load CSV from right here. The first one will be to get the actual secret value from the other server. And you, as you can see, there is a keys.txt at the end. We will save this value as secret. And then we'll use load CSV from. We'll use the URL to our own server this time with the secret appended at the end. So what will actually happen right here is that we will get eventually the secret leaked outside to us. And this is a secret that was sitting inside a different server, not in the server that we had the injection of. So this is kind of an example how we can actually escalate to other machines as well. Um, and notice, just fun thing, the secret with the index 0 is because we used load CSV, so it actually returns as CSV file, but not really. Um, and it doesn't really matter what your type of the file is. It will work, regardless if it's CSV or not. OK, so we talked about a lot here. We talked about Cypher injection and graph databases, denial of service, and other fun stuff with SSRF and escalation in the cloud. But I really want to talk for a second about what we actually did after we discovered all those things. So we did responsible disclosure. We actually contacted Neo4j company and told them about all the risks that you can actually have when you have load CSV enabled. Because we didn't find any way to disable load CSV. And we really wanted a way from them to disable load CSV if we don't use it, so that an attacker won't be able to escalate like that in the cloud. They did understand um, the risk, and they're working currently to provide a solution. But unfortunately, since load CSV is defined in Neo4j as a clause and not as a function, currently, this is not simple to develop uh, a fix that will be able to 
um, to have you disable OCSV, because imagine that you cannot obviously disable match clause. So it is actually defined as clause, this low CSV. You can actually disable all the functions in low CSV, but again, since low CSV is not a function, as it, as it is defined in Neo4j, then you cannot actually use it right now. Um, but since I'm working on a solution, I was like, OK, they will fix it some, at some point in the future. People will be able to disable it. I still want to find a way to be able to leak the same information, but not with low CSV. Uh, this time. And this is where Epoch plugin comes into the, the, the picture. So I did a little research about what it is exactly. This is just a plugin you can install in Neo4j. And I think it is like the most common plugin in Neo4j. Um, and you can obviously use much more features when you install, load, when you install Epoch plugin. So basically, it's just an extension to the language of Cypher in Neo4j. You can just load, import, and import, uh, export other data. And what I thought was, OK, we can actually use Epoch load JSON in a similar way of how we use load CSV. So even if load CSV will be blocked at some point or another, we still have it another way. We can use match, for example, with C character, and then to call Epoch load JSON. And at the end of this third line in the leak, we will still be able to append the leaked information that we want to, to use, actually. So the same injection we can actually achieve with a different thing with Epoch Library. It has to be installed in your, actually, database, so an attacker will be able to use it. But it's very familiar to a lot of developers that actually use Neo4j. And it's just as you talk about uh, Lodash in JavaScript, for example. A lot of people in JavaScript actually use it and install it. So it's pretty common to, to assume that they probably install it. Um, and this is just how it looks like when you have your own server and you use this injection and you get a request. So you get a request with the JSON with the leaked value, and it will send directly from Epoch Procedures for a new 4J. OK, so we talked a lot about the injections, a lot about the risk, and pretty much a lot about what we actually try to do with Neo4j. But let's really try to make a value out of this talk today and understand how we can be protected from those kind of injections. First of all, in order to be able to write uh, as a developer a query, we have to use parameterized queries. And this is the good example. Like, we have to use match and every kind of clause, but with a parameter in inside. So you can see the dollar sign of name. And we can see that we put the name value in a separate parameter of the function that we run. And it actually means that we take the name that we get from the user and use it in a parameter in Cypher. So it doesn't matter if the user tries to insert single quote or double quote. It will be treated as a parameter in query. And it will be mostly escaped. So double quote will be treated as if the double quote, yeah, the double, double quote character and not as the character that terminates the string. So this is what we should do if we develop in graph database and want to avoid injections. And this is the not so good, and you should never do this example, of how we're actually able to write a query in such a way that is prone to injection. We have here in the second line string aggregation of the name. We just insert it like that and don't really do any validation. So the second crime SpongeBob will be what we shouldn't do. I hope that's clear enough. Um, so OK, we talked about re uh, remediation, but we are pretty realistic today. And we know that there can come a time when a new developer will arrive and will write some vulnerable query uh, that will be injectable. So we still want to be able to mitigate our attack surface. What we can actually do right here, if we talk about Neo4j, we have role-based access control. We have a very large uh, way to actually define different users' roles and privileges. We can just, for example, if we have a sensitive database that we want to read data from, and we have other less sensitive database that we want to write to, we can use two different users with two different roles. One will have only write permissions on the sensitive database, and the second will be read, read and write permissions on the less sensitive. So that if there will be an injection, in this sensitive database, an attacker will be able only to read and not to write to it or to update. 
And you have kind of really nice granular rows in Neo4j, so every row is built on the top of the previous row with a few more rows, with, with a few more permissions. And you can actually, if you want to be more protected, revoke some privileges from roles. For example, you can use some role, such as editor, and then revoke all the permissions to execute functions and procedures on these specific roles, so just to harden it. And eventually, I really had to add a point about it because I think it's cool. Uh, we actually got a suggestion from Neo4j regarding epoch procedures. From version 4.3, yeah, 4.3, we can actually have a block list of any epoch procedures we want. So we can actually define in the configuration of Neo4j a block list of um, epoch load and epoch import, for example. And if we actually don't use epoch, we can just uninstall it and by that prevent this kind of scenario. OK, so I really want to say something about Redis Graph. Um, so Redis Graph is an extension to Redis that enables you to write Cypher queries. And I really try to dig into the documentation to understand what you can actually do with it if you have any equivalent of load CSV with it. I found out that there are parameterized queries. There is a support in parameterized queries, so that's great. And I found that there is support in some procedures, db.labels. It can help you if you also want to achieve an injection in Redis Graph. And regarding load CSV, I didn't find load CSV in Redis Graph, but I didn't find case when. You can use it as a kind of an if based with substring. So you can, for example, get the labels using db.labels and check whether the first letter of the first label equals A and combine this with uh, or one equals two and see the result uh, or see an error or see and decide whether re regarding the actual response value of the query. So you can actually achieve this with Redis Graph. And when I try to dig into Redis Graph more deeply and try to really understand if we have any way to have rows and permissions in a similar way of Neo4j, I came across this um, question. I have no idea who this person is, but from, it's from 2021. A person just begged to have some kind of RBAC like we have in Neo4j. And I really tried to understand whether or not this was answered, because I didn't find any reference of having role-based access control in Redis Graph, so I didn't find any. Maybe there is, but I really didn't find any access control that you have in Cypher in Redis Graph. OK, so we talked a lot about injections, Cypher, graph databases, denial of service, SSRF, Redis Graph also, and mitigation and remediation. But I really want you to have a value out of this talk, as I said, and not only see those, uh, I hope, nice slides. I really want you to understand how the injections work. So what I did, I created a playground in Cypher. I will put also, I, yeah, I put a QR code at the end, so you don't really need to, uh, to type it right now. But I really want you to actually clone it. It is all Docker composerized, and it just starts up uh, Neo4j database with data in Redis Graph and has a nice swagger and Postman collections. And just play with it. Try to understand how it works. And then either fix existing injections if you're some security engineer or research, or just start bug bounty. Um, so you can actually hunt for bugs in Cypher. I didn't find any bug bounty write up about Cypher. And I hope that, like, Half a month from now, it will be much different. It will be really awesome it, if it will be that different. And eventually, you can just use the remediations and mitigation that we talked about if you're just some security engineer. Or you can just profit from learning and understanding about another thing that maybe you didn't know before. Also, if you're just a security enthusiast and wants to do this um, Cypher Playground, though, also, go ahead. I want to, to give credit to a person that I, I found this blog like one year ago, and this is the part of the load CSV, the cool trick. And this person also wrote um, kind of like the basic um, GitHub project that I based my playground on. So thank you for that. And that's all. So thank you, everyone. Um,
Thank you so much. I would like to say that, yeah, this QR code, it's obvious, but I still want to say it. This QR code actually is the yeah, Cypher playground at the bottom. Please feel free to talk with me, to tell me what you think, to tell me about it, to tell me about the playground. And it would be awesome if we just find more articles and write-ups uh, up from now about Cypher. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>